Amicus is a biopharmaceutical company that's committed to improving the lives of patients and families who live with rare diseases by developing next generation therapies. So I think that I, I bring a fair perspective considering that I'm someone who's not living with one of the diseases on which we focus, but try very hard to understand what the patient experience is like, and then of course how that dovetails into the clinical development process. Patient partnerships definitely are increasing in the clinical development, drug development processes. And that's, I think, an evolution of the fact that patients, whether they're individuals or whether they're part of a broader disease organization, patient advocacy organization, that they are more astute, they are more sophisticated. And what I've seen as having the biggest contributor to this is the internet. Uh, back in the day, uh, we didn't have the internet and people were calling the patient organizations to say, here's my diagnosis, here's my child's diagnosis, what can we do, what is the current research, is there a trial available, what is a trial? And you had that opportunity to really engage and educate. And while that still exists, it exists differently because of the internet. People are now able to get online and to start that search for information themselves. Uh, in particular, the rare disease space, of which I'm most familiar, is one when there's a diagnosis, the physician will often say, especially if it's, if it's a really difficult disease, uh, possibly terminal, possibly without a current treatment, uh, where they'll say, don't go on the internet. So of course it's the first thing that a parent does or an individual who themselves has the diagnosis. And with that they start searching to see who's doing research, whether it's, they may not even know about something like clintrials.gov at that point in time, but they'll start Googling and they'll see who's doing research from the academic side, from the industry side, they will find the patient advocacy organizations, and then they start calling around. And so by getting the information at that early point in their journey, uh, actually not the journey, if it's diagnosis, they could have been going through a diagnostic journey that takes quite some time. But when they do start to investigate on their own, they start to become educated, they start to become empowered, and they start to take things into their own hands. So you've had that trend that has gained momentum, particularly not only from the internet and being able to do searches, but with social media with people then finding each other, developing their own pages, developing their own communities online, uh, which reinforce those physical communities through conferences and meetings and things like that. But it really has helped people connect uh, with others like them all over the world. And somebody who does know about a clinical study may mention it to somebody else. So you have that piece going on. Uh, furthermore, I think that just in healthcare alone, we see much more general consumerism. So people have, uh, they have to look for their own health insurance at many times, especially now with, with the Affordable Care Act, people have to understand what is the exchange, where do I go, who can cover me, what are the differences, and many people can navigate that on their own. I would say many more cannot, and they use people who are healthcare advocates to help them in that process. But again, that's an indoctrination to the education, to having to take responsibility. So with the, all of that uh, increasing sophistication as a healthcare medical consumer, people who were diagnosed with the disease for which there's not uh, either a readily available treatment, certainly not a cure, or there may be a treatment that doesn't suit their lifestyle, or they've tried and maybe it has some adverse effect for them personally and they'd like to look for an option. So all of these things make people more engaged and then they're typically, and, and I believe should be approaching their healthcare professional, their physician, um, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, whomever, a genetic counselor in some cases to say, what can I do? And that's the partnership. It should be looking at disease management together in partnership where where physicians are sharing information that they know, patients are asking about things, and if a physician or other healthcare professional does not know about what the patient is asking, the hope is that they will do some research themselves. Patient advocates in industry uh, are gaining momentum. Uh, there's more of a trend to have these functions in a corporate setting than several years ago. 
companies such as, as Amicus has been doing patient advocacy as a corporate function since its earliest days, and that's because the, the company is really dedicated to the patient experience and understanding what that is so that they can put together the best clinical development program. Uh, the, where it's increasing is very interesting that uh, through BioNJ and Merrill Data Site uh, 2012, we did a survey of companies in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area to see what they knew about patient advocacy, what their current commitment or potential future commitment to that function might be. And there were, I think it was about 75 companies from the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area who responded. And amongst those companies, a high majority said that they either had or were considering having a patient advocacy function. However, of those, only 19% actually had dedicated staff to the function. Uh, that was done a couple of years ago. I suspect and hope that that has changed since, that there may be more. I think that what's happening is if you you know, go, going back to what I was just saying about the partnership and the increasing uh, sophistication and education of healthcare consumers and, and people who are looking for clinical trials, that companies realize they need to have somebody to speak to them. And it may not be the public relations or corporate communications person. And it shouldn't be the head of clinical operations. Uh, so that there has to be an internal protocol. Who gets these questions? And are they equipped to answer them? And who's going to help guide them through that process? Because the relationship with the patient is tantamount. I mean, it's uh, if a patient doesn't believe in what a company is trying to accomplish, if there isn't some basis of trust there, um, and I'm not saying necessarily between the individual patient or family member and the company, but with the patient organization, that that's their um, that's their portal in many cases. Uh, to information because the companies will speak with the leaders of the patient communities to learn what's going on in that disease space, to learn what it is that people living with this disease need to make a difference, what are their unmet medical needs, et cetera. And uh, so, so there is that relationship, and with that relationship comes uh, responsibility on both sides of, of the equation, I think. And so we are seeing an increase. We are seeing the fact that in order to be patient-centric, you can't just say it, you have to be it. And if you don't have a dedicated or at least partially dedicated uh, individual or department or whatever the structure may be to that, then how can one be trusted? When developing patient centricity within a company or deciding at what point uh, one will jump in with their relationship with a patient community, uh, my experience has been key in a couple of, of disease areas that the earlier, the better, and it's never too early. And what I mean by that is, uh, aside uh, in particular that you may have a, a paradigm-shifting approach to treating a disease, it may be new technology, it may be a completely new delivery, something that, that's novel. Uh, and different than what standard of care might be, or certainly if there is no standard of care and you're the, the, the first, first comer, then you need to make sure that the patient community understands what it is you as a company is trying to accomplish. What is it that you want to learn about the disease, about the endpoints, how to conduct um, a trial, first how to develop a protocol, then conduct a trial that will meet those endpoints, not only from the business side, but also from the patient need side. And if a company, uh, and I have seen this, if a company waits too late and they wait until they're, let's say, phase three, things are looking good, uh, they're thinking about submission, and they want to make sure that the patient community is engaged with where they are and where they hope to go, the patient community may be less trusting. They may, they may be less suspect. Oh, you're getting closer to approval. You're getting closer to your revenue uh, expectations, and now you need us. Now you're interested in giving us a grant to support our annual conference, or, or now you want to do some sort of a program with us. But when you start at the beginning, as early as preclinical, and when you start to have good information, good data, and as I said earlier, that may be different than what people have been thinking about up until that point in time, it's important to do that education. Obviously, you're doing the education with your key opinion leaders, with your KOLs, with your um, investigators or hope-to-be investigators. 
But if you, and they're your partners, but if you don't engage the other partners, then the later you do it, the harder it could be. And uh, also, if you don't do it early enough, then it's going to be, in my opinion, more difficult to enroll those clinical trials because it's through the patient community that a lot of the information about available clinical trials is disseminated. And if you're not engaging, then how are you going to give that information? ClinTrials.gov is an amazing resource. And uh, the FDA continues to try and make it more, uh, not just patient friendly, but more layman friendly in terms of navigation and all of that. But people still need an introduction and an education to, to how to use the online resources. And again, they'll often look to the to their own patient community, to the organizations. They may look to their physicians as well, and we certainly hope that they do, but they're looking everywhere. And so if that engagement is not there early enough, the company, I believe, misses out. With the patient advocacy trend, patient centricity, patient focus, I mean, there's all of this lingo that's out there, uh, and it's hot. You know, you can't pick up an, an industry publication or go online and not read something about how to engage the patient community. For several of us who've been in this field for a long time, and we are colleagues and have become friends, in particular as, uh, as we have all focused on the rare disease space, it's a, it's a very tight-knit community. And we have seen the growth as it's developed. We see the fact that there are companies who haven't had longer-term experience, and they're trying to jump in and be patient-centric. They may be thinking about putting a, a full staff or a, a skeleton staff in place to develop their patient advocacy department, but they're not exactly sure how to do it, and they're not exactly sure who to do it. Frankly, if you're looking to hire a medical director, you pretty much know what that phenotype is, what the education is, what the previous career experience may be, and you can track that candidate. If you're looking to set up a patient advocacy department or function, where do you go? Uh, what is that phenotype? There is no graduate degree in patient advocacy. In fact, there's no undergraduate degree in patient advocacy at this point in time. So what we've noticed is a need for industry to be educated as to what this role is and can be. We also think that there's a need for people who have an interest in patient advocacy to learn about it. There has been no professional society or professional association for this. There has been certainly for genetic counselors, for example. So if in industry you're interested in building a patient advocacy department and you're in a, in a genetically based disease, a genetic counselor, a social worker, someone who has that type of experience and has an interest in bringing that to industry is, is a very viable candidate. However, they may or may not understand the industry side of it and what industry needs. So, so what we've done is we have, uh, over the last three years, we've really been thinking and maybe even overthinking, what, what could this look like? How can we help to train people who want to be patient advocacy professionals in industry, biotech, big pharma? Uh, I believe that there's, we haven't explored this as much, but I believe for contract research organizations, there's as much a need. And how, what, do they, what do they learn? Who do they learn from? And so we've decided to put together a professional association. There are three of us at the core. There are several others who are interested. Uh, grant money helped to, to get this off the ground just in terms of the administrative work. And what we are now developing is PPALS, which is Professional Patient Advocates in Life Sciences, is a, a means for people to learn through face-to-face -face events as well as online curricula. Uh, the, how to learn the strategies and what, what needs to be done, but there will be certification. So that this gives a lot of credibility to this profession. It gives people a touchstone on what they should expect when they're looking to enter industry or to climb within industry in this space. What, is, what are the appropriate salaries? What, you know, how do you negotiate that uh, when it's the first time that a company is entertaining this function? And, and at the same time, for people who are in the industry, how do they continue to develop? Uh, how do they network with each other? Not just um, 
not, not just at a conference that may have one or two sessions on patient engagement where they may you know, rub up against somebody who has some experience, but where everybody in the room has a similar interest. And, and we think that that's going to be a big plus. Similarly, we're going to be working with and we expect to be offering patient advocacy training or education also that could be um, certified if one so wishes for the volunteer organizations, for the patient advocates who come from the disease communities, whether they're volunteers or whether they're professional but on the nonprofit side, so that, uh, let's say, parallels are, are going on. And, and I think that if there's a good meeting of the minds, a good understanding of what's needed on both sides, that what will come from that are better partnerships in the development of drugs and devices to help people living with diseases live better lives. So PPALs will, uh, we are now working on our grants to keep our, to, to make our ideas a reality. And so with that, we expect to be able to start to pull together an online presence. My guess is it will be um, skeletal at first. Uh, those of us working on this have day jobs as well, but we do expect to be pulling together a web presence and that we will uh, continue to build that. We also um, will determine how we're going to be disseminating our, our information. But it's interesting, whomever we speak with thinks that this is a great idea and they're, sign me up. And it's, uh, we're, we're very excited about it and we think it's something um, whose time has come. Mm -hmm.